Today at queenbeing.com, I'm sharing with you something special, something different than I usually share. It's the personal story of someone who the world has kind of let down. Carlita has been treated unfairly by not only her narcissist, but also by the court system. The unfortunate thing is the reason she was treated that way is because of the color of her skin. I'm going to share with you Carlita's story in her own words. By sharing this video, you're going to help Carlita resolve her problem and you're going to be able to help other women in her situation. Maybe we can create change in the court system. It's ridiculous that in 2018, this woman is still struggling. This should have been resolved so many years ago. Please help me help Carlita today. Watch the video, share the video, and share it with anyone who will listen. Here is Carlita's story. Closed captioning provided by Athena Moberg and cptsdfoundation.org. Carlita works hard every single day. Her children range between the age of 8 and 24 years old. She was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She graduated from the Cleveland School of Arts. In 2002, Carlita relocated to Georgia and she currently resides in Fayetteville. Not only did Carlita survive horrific child abuse in various forms, but she's also a survivor of narcissistic abuse in a marriage. Somehow, this amazing woman has managed to keep her positive attitude and her beautiful smile, not to mention her mental and spiritual stability, in spite of all of these things she has gone through. As she's currently working to heal herself, she's also working to provide for her family and to do it alone. She's not even getting the base amount of child support, despite the fact that her ex-husband, the narcissist, who by the way, as you'll hear in the, today's video, appears to be Caucasian, makes far more money than she. She's also still kind, still loving, and doesn't have a single bit of hate in her heart for anyone. And I, for one, love that. Please share this video and let everyone you know know this story so that perhaps we can create some real change and shine a light on this injustice that's happening to her. Take a look. Carlita, welcome to my channel. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. So people know you are one of my co-authors on my most recent book, and you are also a survivor. So let's start off by just talking about how did you meet your narcissist in the first place? I first met him actually online and then we set up different uh visits he was actually in new york and oh. he came to atlanta several times we had a long distance relationship and we were we talked every day all day every day he came here to visit several times that's basically that's how we met would you say that you were kind of love bombed at the beginning as far as like, because everything happened really fast, you started kind of instantly talking all the time or when did you feel the love bombing phase or did you feel that? We started talking all the time after maybe about a week or two. And at that time, did you kind of think, well, this is amazing. This is my soulmate or how were you feeling about it? From everything that he was saying and what he was doing, I thought, where has this man been all my life? He is the best thing since sliced bread. Why haven't I met him sooner? I feel you. When he came to visit you, how did that go at first? It was awesome. We did everything that I ever wanted, but I think that's because I gave the blueprint of all of the things that I wanted and all the things that I liked. And he made himself into that very person. You experienced that same thing. At what point did he move to you? Did he move to be there with you? About a, it was about a year later. Okay. And how often did you guys see each other during that year, would you say? I think it was four, between four and six times. As someone who was in a long distance relationship, would you agree that it's easier for a narcissist to be in a long distance relationship and hold the illusion up longer? Absolutely, because you can be so fake on the phone and online. Yes. And the person that you really are doesn't show up until you're there. Mm -hmm. And at what point would you say that that person really showed up for you? Oh, my goodness. Maybe a month after he moved here, if that long. That you can recall, what was the first sign that he was who he is? When he first got to my house, it was my furniture. And What did he say? He talked about getting rid of it and he used some foul language, but there was nothing wrong with what I had. I worked for absolutely everything that I had. I was a single mother, I was a business owner, and I paid for absolutely everything that I had with my own money. And I bought a nice furniture set. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> 
How did you react? Were you shocked when he when he came out about with his furniture criticism? For me, it was who do you think you're talking to? Where are you? I know that you aren't talking to me and about my stuff. I went off. There was some some yelling and going back and forth. So you're not going to come in my house and talk to me or talk about my stuff like that. And how did he react to that? He got quiet and then he called his mother. What did his mother do? Anything? Did he come back to you with an apology or how did he react? It was just like a sideways apology. And his mother told him basically that, you know, you just went into her house. She's worked for that stuff. So his mother, you don't think she was a narcissist or was she just being good that day? I absolutely think that she needs one. I think in hindsight, we can always go, oh, red flag, red flag, red flag. But while you're in the middle of it, it's harder to see that. What was your initial take on that situation? Did you initially think this guy's an abuser or did you think who the hell does he think he is and then move on from that? It was, who the hell do you think you are? But it was little things here and there that would happen. And then looking back on it now, I'm like, wait a minute that was that and here's this added to this and everything added up once it was after the fact in the middle of it i didn't think about wait a minute this is this isn't what is supposed to be happening this isn't how people are supposed to treat somebody no it, it wasn't that i thought that it, he was an abuser but he was a liar and i still ignored it because i had feelings involved was there a point early in the relationship where you were like oh no Forget about it. Or did it not happen until later for you? Early on, something just told me, ask him if he is married. The very first thing that he told me was that he was divorced. Was he married? Yes. Everything was already set for him to move here. He told me that he didn't feel like he was married. The divorce was filed, but the paperwork was not finalized. I was very angry, but at that time, I didn't really know how to say, stop, back up. I don't want to do this. So I let everything go forward, and he still moved here. And then I found out after I was pregnant with my daughter, and we were about to get married, that not only was he still married, he had not filed for divorce. His ex-wife filed for divorce. She filed for divorce after he moved here. All while I was talking to him, you know, all night, all day, he was still living in the house with her. And so what did you, when you found that out, you were pregnant, you're about to have a baby, you're about to get married, what did you do? How did you handle it? I didn't know what to do. I was angry. I was yelling. But at that point, I'm already pregnant. We are about to get married. Now, what do I do? So how did you, what did you, you obviously went ahead with it? It convinced you? Yeah. They're really good, aren't they, with those words? Because it's always, I'm going to mess up, but then I'm going to do all of these things to make you feel the way that you felt when you first met me. So every time you had a legitimate concern, he brought back the love bombing. Yes. So as you move forward, you have your baby, you get married. He, I assume he got the divorce finally. The divorce from was the- finalized in February. We got married in July. So you got married and then you had your baby at some point before or after you got married? After. So you have your baby, you're married, and that's always hard by itself, having a new baby in the house. During that time, was he helpful with the baby? It depended on whether or not he was working. If he was working, no, he was absolutely unattentive if he wasn't working then he was possessive because i already had two children and he thought that that was just his baby until he wanted to do something then when he wanted to do something then it was he wanted my oldest to watch the baby that how were you managing at this time were you still trying to stand up for yourself or had you stopped doing that at that point i think i'd stopped doing it at that point I had so much going on. I had a baby. I had two jobs. I wanted a wedding. So after I had my baby, that was when I got my second job. I paid for, I want to say, 90% of my wedding. So then you had an actual wedding. After you got married legally, you had a wedding. A year later on our anniversary. It was hard because I was doing everything by myself. I made pretty much all of the decisions. He didn't even have any friends 
to be in the wedding. So everyone that was in the wedding was from my side, yeah. everybody. His, And because of his religion, his mother didn't even show up. After the wedding, how, how quickly did the honeymoon end? Or was oh, it? ended before that yeah. because see, we were already married for a year right yeah. within that first year there were crazy things going on I came home from work and found him on the computer telling someone what he would do to her there was a lot of arguing and he took no responsibility I guess no was his excuse, well, you never, hey, you know, you never come and do this with me anymore, so I have to reach out to other people? He could not say, oh, well, we're not, therefore I have to go. And it, he couldn't have said that to me because that, that was not the case. I got you. It was just that that's what he was doing. Do you think he was a sex addict or do you think it Absolutely. was? Absolutely. I see that I, a lot. I sent him to Sex Addicts Anonymous, but he only went to two classes. He claims that they told him that he wasn't an addict. Yeah, I bet they did. I bet they didn't. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How long were you guys together overall? 11 years. How long between him moving in and you getting married legally? When? How long was that? Was that a year or less, less than a year? Almost a year. Obviously, this has been a stressful relationship from the beginning, basically, from the time that he moved to you, right? Yeah. And then at what point did you think to yourself, I need to get out of here? Or did that take a while for you? I may have been pregnant. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't when I was pregnant, I definitely had thoughts of it after I had my daughter. So you're in this situation, you're thinking, mm, I don't know if, I'm done, if I've done the right thing. You continue with the relationship. Is that because you felt trapped with him? Yes. Or what? Obviously, you were financially independent before you had been a single mom. Was he controlling you financially? Was he abusing you financially? How did he make you think you were stuck? I was financially independent, except I did have help from other sources. Okay. So I did own my own business, mm -hmm. but I also qualified for things like Section 8. They were paying a portion of my rent. So okay. I could handle everything else except for everything and all of my rent. And I lived in an expensive area. It's not like I was paying like five, six hundred dollars in rent. Multiply that by three. Call me what you must, but I like living in a better area. Uh, it's safer and they have better schools. I feel you. I'm with yes. you. Yeah. 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 It has been better for my son. My son went to the one of the two top schools in my county and he was able to do that because I live in the county. I don't even live that's not our home school. But oh. because I live in the county he was able to go to that school. So you made the right choice for your family. Yes. And that's, but you still felt stuck with him because you needed him to help pay the bills up to that point. Yes. And he, he made quite a bit of money. I was making money, but I noticed that whenever I was able to buy something without any assistance from him, he mm -hmm. got jealous, intimidated. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. If I was able to pay something, pay for something, and I would say, no, I got it, I, I have money, he would be intimidated by that. Hated that I had money. And he yeah. absolutely hated that I had started my business to have gotten better and I started to have money in the bank, actual mm -hmm. money. And I was starting to talk about uh, buying property for myself. He hated that. Did he feel threatened almost because they have less control if you have your own money? Yes. Is that what you thought? Yeah. As you're going through that, did he try to sabotage your business is my question. Absolutely. I did childcare for 13 years and I also overnight delivered the newspaper. Now, I also did that while I was pregnant. So imagine that. I went to real estate school. He didn't help me with that. I was working two jobs, going to real estate school, taking care of the house, doing all the cooking, all of the cleaning, everything. Jeez. He would do his job and that's it. And so he, he basically let you hold the whole world on your shoulders. Yeah. He wanted all the recognition. He also wanted to be in control and he wanted to be known as the man of the house. My oldest son was the one who technically was 
the man of the house. He was the one that took charge and did the things that needed to be done in the house. Wow. My ex-husband went to work. That's yeah. one thing that you cannot take away from him. He goes to work. He gets up and goes to work. But that's oh. all he does. And I'm guessing he doesn't make enough money to have a full staff. If somebody just gets up and goes to work, they need to make enough money to pay other people to do the other things they need to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But instead, he just made you do it all. I did everything. He would do things like, he was very bad with money. So he came here with a vehicle that he leased. At the end of the lease, instead of, I think he owed $2,500 over what he needed to pay. He didn't have the $2,500 on hand, but he had a credit card with $12,000 limit. I told him, get another car, put the $2,500 on the credit card, we'll deal with it because you make enough money. He bought the car. So he leased the car and then he bought it. So he paid for that car twice. At what point did he empty the bank account? That was after he filed for divorce. Okay. And when did that happen? When he filed for divorce? That was in uh, 2014. What happened was he had an issue with my oldest son. And again, it's because he wanted to be the alpha male, but my son was actually the alpha male. So he was battling with that. So anything and everything that he could do to make things hard for my son, he did mm -hmm. it. He made it a point to constantly call 911. 911 was his best friend. I have never seen the police as many times as I have when I lived with him. Didn't they get tired of him? Did yeah, start but, but I do live in a county where I am still a minority. Oh, that's right. Your husband was Mexican, right? Or Puerto Rican and Colombian. Okay. He looks, he looks Caucasian and he used that to his advantage. That's horrible. Yes. It, call 911 and make all of these false reports or anytime anything little happened, he would escalate it and call 911 so that something would happen. He's gotten my son arrested several times. Saying that my son is this angel, but there are things that really should have happened or been handled in-house without the police. Well, yeah, things happen in families, especially with stepfathers and sons, that's normal. But bringing the police in is really weird. My uh, son was doing a test online that he had to, it was a time test mm -hmm. that he had to do and he had to do it by a certain time as well. He's okay. sitting there and he knew that my son had to do the test. I wasn't home, I was dropping a friend off. He kept calling him and calling him to do something and calling him to do something. And my son finally yelled out. He said, I did like this. And I said, I'm trying to do this test. When I got home, the police were there. Because he said, I'm trying to do this test? That's because, ridiculous. Because he yelled out, I'm trying to do the test. Got there, they knew what was going on. And they said, look, this is just some stepfather type of stuff. And he's trying to do this, that. I see what he's doing. One of the police officers said, I had this kind of issue with my stepson. But that doesn't make it right. But he didn't see it like that because he kept doing it. What led up to the divorce was that I had an issue with my son that just graduated, Eric. Eric was about 13 at the time. Eric was being disrespectful, ran away from me. I went to grab the belt because I'm the authoritarian. Eric went to grab it from me, tussled with me. And we rolled on the bed, rolled off onto the floor. My oldest son ran from his room in there, grabbed my second child, grabbed him and said, no, you don't do that. He ran down the stairs. My oldest son ran after him. When he stopped, he hit him. He punched him mm -hmm. as to say, I'm, you know, the older child saying, look, you don't do that. I'm the older brother. Right. And this, you don't do that. Right. Boys are protective of their moms, for sure. Yeah. My ex-husband got on the phone to call the police and said that he was beating on his autistic brother. And then he said he was threatening him. My ex-husband said that my son was threatening him. Your ex-husband was threatened, being the one being threatened, according mm -hmm. to him. 
Yes. But he was not even involved. He didn't even move. My oldest son was the one that actually took action. Right. My husband, who was in the house, did not move. That's rough. So from there, my son got arrested. And he was 18 at the time? Oh. Yeah, he was He was at least 18. So he has a record now, or does he? No. Good. With this, I went down to the prosecutor's office. What happened was I was on the phone with my mother, and that night my ex-husband heard me tell my mother that he was evil. You call and lie to the police to get people uh, arrested, I'm going to call you evil. That's evil. Yeah, I agree. That's what prompted him to go, oh, okay, well, let me go and file for divorce right now. So I went to the court and I talked to the prosecutor and I said, look, he's lying. This is what's going on. This is what really happened. And she talked to my son and she asked him, are you afraid of your brother? His answer was, yeah, because I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. To well, say, you know, hey, my, bri- my big brother just put me a lesson. Right. Yeah. Not the, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that he's going to beat me up and all of that. So she said to me, I'm thinking about dropping this. Let me listen to the 911 call. She listened to the 911 call, heard my ex-husband say that my son was threatening him. But she also heard me say, no, nobody's being threatened. He's lying. Yeah. She called him and asked him, when did he threaten you? Did he threaten you? He told her no. She said she made sure that she asked him several times. He told her no. So she dropped everything and it is now a restricted report because she knew he was lying. Right. And she wrote an affidavit for me to take to court. You said something about calling DCFS and making a false report. Was that the same situation? He called, he's, he's tried a whole lot of things to try to get custody of my two children with him. Okay. One of those things was calling defects to say that my oldest son was beating on my children. My oldest son plays with the two youngest ones and he taps them and then they start chasing him around the house and they run after him and that's what he did. My daughter said that my brother keeps hitting us and he took that and called defects and said that he was beating on them. So when I asked my daughter, what's going on? She said, well, yeah, Kitty keeps doing this to us and running. Did the caseworker come out to your house or how did that all work out? What she said to me, she initially did an interview with everyone and said, I'm going to close this out. I have to go through the motions, but I'm going to close this out and I'm going to talk to him about making false reports. Thank goodness. Then he used a restricted police report, the one that happened, I guess, when your son with the belt situation and life and act to try to tell the judge that my oldest son was abusive. And he's not Um, allowed to use that because it's restricted. Right. I have to tell everything to everybody. And that's one of the things that I'm going to tell. That is a restricted report. It is like it never happened. No one, no one is supposed to use it for anything. But he did, and and he used it for the to lie to the nine one one operator and the police, which we just kind of talked about. Yes. And then the prosecutor dropped the case after finding out he was lying. Which yes. is well. his first lawyer contacted you requesting a LinkedIn contact while you had an attorney. So what was that about? They're not supposed to contact the opposing party without going through the the attorney. If you have an attorney, they cannot directly contact you. She was sending me requests on LinkedIn while I had an attorney. When I didn't have an attorney, she never sent anything. But when I did have an attorney, I was always getting that from her. We all know that lawyers lie. But she was blatantly lying about things in my case that I can actually prove. Let's talk about that. She said that the judge ordered for me to have a vehicle put in my name. I was supposed to get the title and the insurance and I was supposed to pay for it. This is what she said. You cannot find that in one document in my case. You cannot. And she wanted a ruling on that. That's what the first lawyer did. And she's saying, well, that's what he meant to do. Whether he meant to do it or not, that's a lie because he never said that. And he never signed it. But even if he meant to sign it, I mean, if he meant to say that, it was not in any documents. She's the one that drew it up. And it was, he didn't sign to that. 
So you cannot have a second judge rule on right. something that didn't even happen. But his second lawyer did it. She drew up papers saying that I was supposed to get this vehicle in my name. I was supposed to get pay for it and everything. There is nothing that says that I'm supposed to do that. He was always supposed to pay for it. Even after my temporary order, he was still paying for it until he got upset that I called the police. After he called defects, he called himself keeping my children when they, he was supposed to be bringing them home. The defects worker said to me, no, I am not removing the children from your care. You are supposed to have your children. I think it was at six o'clock. So I waited. He never dropped the children off. I called the police to get an escort to take me to his house to get my kids. Heck yeah. So because I did that, he stopped paying the, um, the note on the truck. And then he said for me to pay it, not the courts. So you did the right thing. And then his attorney decided to punish you or he decided to punish you by making you pay for a car that you couldn't afford to pay for at the time. Yes. And that was, according to them, a condition of what? Keeping the kids? It got repossessed. So he had to pay the, the difference okay. from what it sold at and what was owed. He wants to make me responsible for that. Then he violated the judge's order to contact the bank to allow you to try to save the marital, marital home? He stopped paying the note on the house before mm -hmm. he was even told to get out of the house. So we went and had a, um, we had a court date in like May mm -hmm. of 2014. He was told that he had to leave in June. He didn't pay the mortgage in June. By the 15th, your mortgage is late. So he purposely didn't pay the mortgage that month. And even if I was supposed to pay the mortgage, I wasn't supposed to start paying it until July. He stopped paying it in June, making me already behind by a month. Right. So the house was in foreclosure because I wasn't even awarded enough money to pay the mortgage. None of this was supposed to happen. I was awarded a house with a mortgage, with a $1,700 mortgage, but I was only given $1,400 a month. And that was supposed to cover child support too, right? Right. right. So, and they knew that I had no job. How was I supposed to pay a mortgage and buy food and pay the light bill, the gas bill? How long, how long had you not had a job in that, during the marriage? How, at what point did you officially not have a job? In 2011. And then you so got by to, that time it had been three years. Three years, right. So that seems like it would be it would count as a lifestyle to which you had become accustomed. Yes. Right? They didn't support you that way. No. So you had to get a job or at least start back up on your business. I had stopped the business, the, the child care. And what made you stop it? Because of the area that I was in, it wasn't as the demand wasn't as high. I mean sure. in the area where there are more stay at home moms. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. He initially called the bank as he was ordered to do, but then he called back several days later to tell them not to speak to you, and you found out too late. Yes. I found out after the house was already set to go into foreclosure the next day. What did you do? He was ordered to do this back in, like, November, and I'm calling the bank, and I'm getting to run around, getting to run around. I can't get into contact with anybody. And then I find out in April because they held off on the mortgage for me because I wrote them a letter. So I actually ended up staying in the house for almost a year without paying anything. It didn't allow me to save the house, what I wanted to do. And they said that they could actually have me assume the loan and get a modification at the same time because he, of course, didn't want that to happen. He did not want me to have the big pretty house. He called a couple of days later and told them not to do anything. But of course, nobody knew about it until I called and I was complaining to this lady at the bank. And I said, look, I've been trying to call. Nobody's calling me back. And she says, oh, well, in December, I have these notes that your ex-husband called and said, 
not to talk to you. He removed your child from health insurance, even though he was ordered to keep him on. You're not supposed to take a minor child off of the insurance until the divorce. He took my second child off of the insurance before the divorce was final. I told the judge, and the judge just asked him, did it save him money? Did it? Probably not. Um, because once you're on a family plan, you're on a family plan. So yeah. you can have three kids, two kids, three kids, or ten kids. It's mm-hmm. still the family plan. So he just did it to be a jerk. Yes. To hurt you and your son. Wow. So then you find out, you said that the next day they're going to take your house. How'd that go down? Talk to me about that. That we went to court. Even that day, the bank said, look, get him to sign this paper and we can go forward. He okay. wouldn't sign the paper. He got on the phone, acted like he couldn't get in contact with anybody. Uh-huh. And when I left court, he and his lawyer were laughing. So they thought that this was cute. Okay. My house ended up being um, sold on the courthouse steps the next day. So I got up the next morning and went there to see exactly who it was that had my house. Right. So I know who I needed to contact. So then they uh, they filed the paperwork to take possession of the house after maybe a month or so. They were really nice people. When we went to court, I didn't even know. Because I answered, but it went to him in his name, and he had the mail forwarded. So instead of coming to me, it went to him. So I didn't know that there was even a court date. But I was getting ready for work, and I said, wait a minute. They haven't contacted me. It's been a while. Me about coming to court. Let me find out. You know, let me call them. I went online, and my court case was to be heard that day. So I had to call the lady that I worked for and say, hey, I have to go to court. I hurried up, got dressed, got in there, and he had already signed the paper for me to leave in seven days. Of course, you know, he didn't tell me about the court date. He was not going to tell me that I had to leave in seven days. He was going to let the police show up and put me out. He was trying to hurt you. Yes, he was trying to hurt me, but he was trying to take the kids because you would be homeless. You would be homeless, right. Oh my God, that's infuriating. <laughs> but see, that was, that was nothing but God. How else would I get up that morning and say, hey, I need to look, and I had to be in court, make it into court that day. And I stood up and I told the judge, no, I was the one that answered it, not him. It should have come to me. The judge said, you can go and talk to the um, the owner and see what you can work out. And I didn't get a whole lot of time, but she did say, I will at least give you until the kids get out of school so that you won't have to run around trying to find a place to live and try to get the kids back and forth to school. I started moving the last day of school. So I still had to go to award ceremonies. I went to award ceremonies and... Then came home and moved. It took me, now mind you, I had 20 rooms worth of stuff. It took all weekend. I did not finish moving until Monday morning. You noted that the judge would sign orders without due diligence and the lawyer submitted them without sending it to the opposing party first. You want to talk about that? I had a final hearing and I had to go in by myself because at the last minute I had two, two different lawyers at two different times that both wanted more money before going to the the final hearing although they knew beforehand what my financial situation was they said how much money they wanted and what they would take and then things changed once we got to court so i ended up going by myself and the judge said for his lawyer to contact me so that we could come to an agreement on the parenting plan she sent me the parenting plan and i said no i'm not going to sign it because this promotes parental alienation It said that he could contact the children every night while they were with me, but I couldn't contact the children until they had been with him for a week. The judge told my third lawyer that my ex-husband testified that I was harassing him and calling the children all the time during his visitation. He didn't testify to that. Now, he has tried a lot of things, and he is absolutely no saint. 
Right. But he didn't say that. So the judge lied. To cover his butt. But even if he did say that, the judge had nothing to go on to believe him since he had already been shown that my ex-husband was committing fraud. And it's documented. He accepted the affidavit from the prosecutor saying that he lied, saying the same thing. So he's not going to lie to the prosecutor and then come into court and tell you the truth on the same thing. With him, his story is everybody is harassing him. Everybody threatens him. He walked around with a nine millimeter on his hip. And I didn't even know that it was a threat for someone to clean a gun in front of you. He would constantly clean a gun that he had not used at the kitchen table. And I want you to repeat what you just said. That is a threat. Yes. Somebody does that to you. I contacted the local shelter. That is the person, the advocate is the person that told me that it is a threat for someone to sit around you. What he would do is sit at the kitchen table and clean his gun while we were eating. And see, this is an example of, I think, gaslighting or intimidation and, and both, maybe. Yeah. The judge said some things that didn't go with what the lawyer said. The judge said, well, I drew this up. Here's the problem with that. I got the parenting plan from the lawyer in like August. The judge didn't sign the papers until January. So if the judge drew up those papers, then that would mean that the judge got with the opposing attorney, my opposing attorney back in August to get that together, to draw that up. And then when an order was filed for a reconsideration or a new trial, on the basis, one, one of the points was that she never showed it to me, which she was supposed to. She said that she didn't have to, although she did, she was lying. If it came from the judge, her answer would have been, I didn't draw this up. That came from the judge's chambers. But the judge is saying, oh, it came, I drew that up. No, you didn't. Do you think this is a racially driven situation here? Absolutely. I have spoken to someone that works in that court that said this is something that she has seen from that judge. Oh. And also, she she's seen that a lot with people who look like me. And also, I spoke to another attorney who has issues with this judge. She said that she's had other attorneys come to her and complain that this judge just signs anything that is put in front of it. So you can, apparently you can get anything over with this judge, whether it is legal or not. My ex-husband is Colombian and Puerto Rican, but looks Caucasian. I am in a county where I am still a minority Mm -hmm. and what a lot of people have called it is I'm that court is the good old boys he and his income or his his financial situation has been favored over me and what has been best for me my children or what our needs are and that's completely unacceptable because obviously you're the only fit parent here so far. I mean, at least from what it sounds like to me. Right. But it, it is what happened in my case is not even what is customary. I cannot tell you how many lawyers I have been to that have told me that's not what should have been done. Every lawyer that I spoke to said, this is not what is customarily given. The judge even said, because I've had two judges. The judge that was initially signed, assigned to my case was out because of health reasons. So a retired judge sat in for him for my temporary hearing. And when the judge assigned came back at that final hearing, he said, this judge usually awards more. Is that judge Caucasian the one that did this? May I ask? Both of them are. What judge- should have happened is if... They were making my ex-husband leave 
to go to, we had two houses. They were making him leave to go to the other house. He had the income to be able to pay the mortgage on both houses. He also had the income to be able to pay child support. I was not even awarded the amount of child support that is in my worksheet. So legally, I, I don't get what I'm legally supposed to get with child support. Wow. And no one has done anything about it. This is why we're telling this story. Where does it stand right now? Right now, I have to file a bunch of complaints. So I have to file a complaint on the judge. And mm -hmm. then I don't really know, but I do have to. I'm going to contact the ACLU, the NAACP. Mm -hmm. I've already started contacting the newspapers and the news stations. I've already sent those. I'm waiting to hear back from somebody, but I'm just going to keep going and keep contacting people until somebody says, hey, we have to do something about this. So let's get our survivor community behind us here. Let's talk about this. Who do they call? What should they do? If they want to help you, how can they help you get seen by the right people? What can we do to help you get justice? Honestly, what I need is a barracuda of a lawyer that will step in and say, this is wrong and mm -hmm. this isn't even legal. This is what is supposed to be done. Yeah. My ex-husband was supposed to lose this case a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Once the judge found that it, there was fraud. But mm -hmm. as far as the complaints, I have the documentation. So that has to come from me. So you need a good lawyer. You need, you're doing your part. You're putting your stuff together to file your, your complaints. Yes. But you need somebody who's going to come in there and stand up for you and help you yes. get what you deserve. This judge is being investigated for criminal misconduct, but he, he's not seeing any criminal cases, but he's still seeing family law cases. So I don't understand how is he not, he's, he's unethical when it comes to criminal cases, so he can't see those, but he's okay to see family court. That's insane. Family, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but like, it seems to me like family court is almost more important when we're talking about not just financial stuff, but especially the well-being of the kids involved. But if you have misconduct in one area, you're not going to be ethical in the others. That's just not how this works. Absolutely. I, I want the community to, to rally around you here because it's not just your case. There have to be other people who are being abused by this court, right? And it, that is my issue. When I was going through this, I said, I need to do something because I know that I cannot be the only person going through this. No way. And people do not help you if you are going through a divorce mm -hmm. and you have not been beaten. I have found that out. I went to everyone, legal aid, every every place that helps people i contacted them i even contacted the law school no one helps you unless it is physical abuse it does not matter that he emptied the bank account and i had no money to pay for a lawyer i just had to figure it out i went to family law workshops so i know that part but there were things that i didn't know Add that on to everything that I had to do. I had to find a house to live, maintain that, get find a way to get back and forth to work. I had no vehicle. It just so happened that one of the agencies that I went to had someone donate a van. That's how I got a vehicle. Wow. Thank goodness for that. You know, everything happens for a reason. But I did notice that what you need to do, if, you, if you're like me, you are somebody that does not really like to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I got more help once I started letting people know what was going on and saying that I needed help. That is excellent advice for our fellow survivors, especially those who are still stuck and those who are trying to move forward now. I really appreciate you sharing that. So you said to me that the, the judge said you didn't ask for alimony, but that wasn't true. And it's in my paperwork. It's documented. It is stamped and filed in the court that I asked for alimony. And yet the judge blatantly lied about that. Yes. 
But there is a woman who does not look like me, uh -huh. who grosses $90,000 a year, who had a very similar case to mine. I know because I sat in the court and listened to her trial. Her lifestyle was very similar to mine. The only difference is that they made more than we did. Okay. But so she, we're talking about a white woman. Yeah, Caucasian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I just want to clarify. Go ahead. She grossed $90,000 a year. Her ex-husband is a pilot. She got alimony, half of everything, and child support. I got not enough child support and nothing. But if I made $90,000 a year on my job, I wouldn't need the alimony. When I went to court, again, I was making $800 a month. The attitude is, oh, well, she needs to go get a job. The judge was informed about your ex lying and doing all the things, lying on the financial affidavit, lying about IRS debt. The judge refused to do anything. That information was taken down. He said to the, the lawyer, and I have, it, I have it in the documents, he said to her, what do you want me to do, impeach him? My lawyer said, yes. He should have been impeached. Once you find out that someone is lying about something, especially money, then they are supposed to lose that case in a divorce. The judge filled in an amount of your ex's 401k in a document dated 2014. It was like fill in the blank, but she's, she's not entitled to the 401k amounting to this. Right. This shows that the judge did not do due diligence because the paperwork that he got that figure from stated 2014 wow. we went to court in 2015 so we went to court in 2015 you're supposed to have the current figures for that time he signed it in 2016 he did not pay attention to it saying 2014 even though he signed it in 2016 and we went to court in 2000. There's so much more to Carlita's story than what you just saw, but this is where I'm going to end it today. If you can help her, please send her an email to the address on your screen right now. And if you can't do anything personally to help her, at least please share this video on your timeline and tag anyone you know who either might be able to help or who might be interested in helping to create change. It is our goal to find Carlita, a strong attorney who's able to help her in her city, her state, which is Fayetteville, Georgia. That's all I've got for you right now. But as always, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life. And hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. Don't forget, you're never alone. You've always got your spanily. I'll see you soon.